People slowly walk through an abandoned Air Force base, taking in everything they see. The ground is covered in filth. Scaffolding towers have been knocked over and destroyed. Cars lay on their roofs, burning in the morning sun. Some people are picking through what remains of their belongings in their trampled tents. It looks like a war zone. And really, that's not far from the truth. It might surprise you that this is the aftermath of one of the biggest music festivals of the 90s, which shares a name with one of history's most loving and peaceful events. This week on Cheeky Tales, we cover the unravelling events of the Woodstock 99 Music Festival. Welcome back, boy. <laughs> Thanks, boy. Thanks for that intro. <laughs> um, Woodstock. 99. Yeah. Is this our anniversary episode? No. Oh, that was last week. Maybe. Well, let's just say it's our two-year anniversary episode and you're uh, a bit of a throwback to Bloomfest. Yeah. I was pretty happy to do another, mm. uh, another, uh, another unraveling festival. event. Yeah. yeah. Let's say it is the- It's yeah, definitely just, not. It was say August it we uploaded the first one. No, it's, no, it's this one. Yeah, great. Two years. <laughs> woo! <laughs> Two years, 59 episodes, one off the 6-0. Oh, you big 6-0. The, yeah. the sextarian. 70s, 70 would be sextarian, but anyway. Mm. Septarian. Is it? Is six sex? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think is it, it is because okay. sept is seven, I'm pretty sure. Sick. All right. Well, anyway, after we get that- uh, that out of the way. Geometry nerds. Yeah. Geometry. Yeah. Yeah, true. Well, yeah, that that's us. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, geometry chat, the new episode, uh, the new podcast coming from the Cheeky Boys next week. It's, it's Cheeky Tales, SR71 chat, Cheeky yeah. Tales, geometry chat. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the CTU is kicking off. <laughs> uh, what do you reckon, Sean? Oh, Sean's not here oh, again this he's week. he's not here. What a bastard. <sighs> so, um, and I was really hoping he'd be here for this one in particular because yeah. it covers some of Sean's least favourite bands. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I actually might, if I have him over, I'll try, <laughs> I'll try and get him to just talk into a microphone about these bands. Okay. And if, if any of the lines that he say that he says fit into the podcast, <laughs> I'll just, just cut him in. Cut him in? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, nice. Um, all right. So, so what do you know about this? Anything? It shares the name with an alcoholic drink. Woodstock. That's a drink, isn't it? No. Like a pre-mixed can? No, I don't think so. Yeah, let's do a quick Google on that one. Uh, okay, no, you're right. Yeah. Good job. You're the booze hand of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I just get you to say that again, please? You I, were correct. Thank you. Glad that you know your alcohol well, sir. I've never drank it, but- Yeah. Did you even know that there was more than one Woodstock? No. Nah. No. Nah. What's the- Is it 69? Woodstock 69? Yeah, nice. Is that like the- That's uh, the original the one. The original one? Yeah. yeah. That's the one I know of. Yeah. And then that, there was like Woodstock with, 94. And that's like with uh, 69 was with Jimi Hendrix and stuff on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's- I don't know about 99. Yeah. Is, is this Firefest? No, not Firefest. Well- Let's keep that in mind for later. All right. Mm. I actually have uh, a little visual aid for us. Ooh. Yes. Uh, I'm going to put it on. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Put it on the big screen. Yep. But I'm going to do it somewhere that we can see it. Um, so this is actually uh, relevant to the to the episode. It's not just me wanting to watch something. Okay. Um, so it is the full... Live oh, nice. set Limp Biscuit. of Limp Biscuit at Woodstock 99. Now, it's important, this set in the story. So, you and I are going to get to see it. I would suggest that uh, anyone listening goes and has a, has a quick look uh, at this. It is an hour long set, but it'll give you an idea. I'll be watching the full set. We're going to, I'm just going to leave it playing. Oh, okay. And, um, just keep an eye on the crowd and like what's going on. Can you tell me what songs they're playing? Because I don't know if it, I don't know about you or if you know this about me. Are you a huge Limp Biscuit fan? Probably around ninety nine to the two thousands. Yeah. I was. Well, that was their peak. I was. Yeah, I was in the Limp yeah. Biscuit, and um, before cricket, 
one of my go-to songs to pump me up for cricket is- Break Stuff? Not Break Stuff. Oh. It is- um, oh, Is it Nookie? No. It's the Mission Impossible. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Song. Um, but look at how hyped he is. Look at him. Look at him go. Wait till you see a shot of the crowd, by the way. Woodstock 99 was huge. Yeah, that looks massive. Yeah, look at that. Look at it. There's a huge crowd. And just watch how they're all jumping together for like hundreds of meters. My my on my cricket pump up playlist, mm. um, I have Limp Biscuits take a look around. Ah. I I think that was a little bit after this. Yeah, it's not in this set. List. No, but break stuff is definitely in there. Nookie's in there. What was the rest of the songs they play? Uh, you got Just Like This, uh, yeah. Show Me What You Got, Counterfeit, 1999, Thieves, Stuck, Rearranged, Break Stuff, Nookie, Interlude, Significant Other Mashup, and Faith. Oh, uh, the Michael George cover, Faith, mm. that slaps that song. Yeah. I do like that song. But yeah, if you ever want to get in the mood for a fight, definitely listen to Break Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, keep that in mind too. <laughs> so, let's kick off. Did you know that about me, that I was- a bit of I a Limp Biscuit metalhead in the that, early no. 2000s. They're not metal. Metal enough for me. They're, they're new metal in the sense that there's a guy with a deck up there going, wicked, wicked, wicked. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Look at, Look at that crowd. crowd. I know. It's 200,000 people. Same yeah. amount of money as uh, DB Coops. Yeah. Follow the money. Dollar bill for every Follow person the at money. Woodstock 99. <laughs> so, the backstory. I would say it's a safe bet that most of our listeners know about Woodstock the counterculture music festival that took place in 1969. Nice. Countercultural. Counterculture. Counterculture. Okay. Mm. Why was it counterculture? Well, at that time- Because it was, it was like a piece. Yeah, and it was like hippies and stuff. Yeah, and it was 69. That would have put it near, I want to say Vietnam. Yep. Right in the middle of Vietnam. Yep. Right in the middle of the moon landing too. Yep. Uh, the original Woodstock might be a story of its own one day for us, but to give you a brief idea of what took place- Organisers originally planned for five uh, for 50,000 people to turn up to a small dairy farm outside Bethel, New York, which itself was outside the namesake, namesake town of Woodstock. Despite only selling tickets in record stores in the greater New York area or via mail-in, they sold 186,000 tickets prior to the event. So three times, or just over three times what they were expecting. Nearly four times, yeah. Yeah, nice. When the day came to open, they found that they hadn't adequately prepared ticket booths and fences, and so were forced to open the festival up to anyone that could get there for free. (laughs) Eventually, an estimated 450,000 people would clog the roads in and around Bethel. Wow. Nine times what they expected. This is the original 69. Yep. Yep. Nice. Causing chaos for the locals who couldn't control the influx of festival goers. As the event began, the rain set in. Uh, sporadically showering everyone at the event and creating a muddy mess, not just on the site, but in all the streets around. The hygiene, first aid and food and drink providers for the event were totally overwhelmed, especially when the bad acid started being taken all over the festival. Now, do you reckon with that amount of people when it rained, there were sections of people being rained on and sections of people not being rained on? Probably. That's pretty cool. Like you're in one group of people. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. But the clouds moving over at different times. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, one thing, just going back to this uh, this festival performance, check out all the stuff being hurled in the crowd. But you notice it's something you don't see today. Look how many people are just standing around on the stage, like on the outside edges there. Are they crowd members? No. Or they're just- They're just like people. Just roadies and stuff. Like Kid Rock's there, Puff Daddy's there, like other people oh, right. that performed are in there. They're just and like they're just, standing around watching. watching. Yeah. There's heaps of people there. There's probably like 50 people on stage that aren't in the band. I did not know that about the guitarist and the biscuit. I had no idea that he wore like face paint like that. Yeah. Every performance, I think, to this day. Also, are they not just like the most white trash band you've ever seen? <laughs> they are. They definitely are. <laughs> uh, anyway. <clears throat> oh, I didn't. Did I do a pun? No. All right, boy. Let's um, play that funky podcast, White Boy. That's me. <laughs> I'm the white boy. <laughs> Despite all the poor experiences, the music set the stage for a pivotal moment in the counterculture movement in the United States. Yeah. And to this day, Woodstock is seen as an important cultural touchstone and is referenced regularly in modern media. Is there an Australian version of Woodstock, like 69? I feel like- I don't think so. Mm, okay. The event itself was a total financial failure and almost- <laughs> <laughs> Even though they had nine times more people than yeah, they you've expect- got to remember, they didn't expect any of them. Yeah, and not everyone paid for tickets, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
It almost bankrupted the organisers until a movie was released in 1970 uh, that gave them the royalties to pay back their debtors and set them up for life. It took almost 50 years for the locals to forget, though, as the town of Bethel would ban large gatherings and block access to the site in future to ensure there was no follow-up. Until festivals. 2011? Yeah, something like that. Wow. No, 50 years would be 2019. Oh, really? That long? Oh, 16, oh yeah, 69, yeah. yeah. So until like four years ago. <laughs> yeah. They only recently were like, all right, fine. Yeah. And then Woodstock 2020 happens. Yep. Half a million people convert on New Bethel. It was Bethel. Bethel. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I'm pretty glad I'm telling the story rather than living it because uh, it sounds pretty gross. It looked and pretty gross. Music festivals just- <sighs> When they rain, yeah, they're all pretty gross. Again, here's some information about me. Well, Never about been to, to a music festival. About the time he killed a guy at a festival. What? Never been to to a music festival. Never been to any of those like Splendor. Look at, look at this crowd. Yeah. Like, look at, look at how far back they're jumping. It's like 100 metres back from the stage and they're jumping around. What are the ones we have here? Like Splendor in the Grass, Good Times. Yeah, Good Times is probably the biggest. Good Times is probably the, the most equivalent to Woodstock. Never, never been to one. I am not a huge live music person. Yeah. Well, I was looking at Good Times, but it was like 225 bucks. Which isn't too bad when you think about the number of bands you see. But yeah, man, but I went to Soundwave in the day and that was dope. To me, it's just you're paying, what, 220 bucks to go stand in the sun all day, get dehydrated and come home with a wicked sunburn. So that doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. And they are always in the heat of summer too. Mm. Like you never have a spring festival. And with that many people, like, could mm. you imagine the human stench? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're getting to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, boy, it kicks off. Yeah, right. One of the co-founders of the event, Michael Lang, who had been the chief organiser of original Woodstock, would look to recapture the magic of Woodstock again on the 35th anniversary of the event in 1994. The 35th what, sorry? Anniversary. Thank you. Anniversary. Anniversary. (laughs) Anniversary. Anniversary. Yeah, so he wanted to hold a a two-day festival in 1994 Mm -hmm. um, to uh, do the 25th anniversary. Let me guess, Woodstock 94? Yes. Mm. While many said that uh, Woodstock 94 lived up to the musical reputa- uh, reputation of Woodstock, it sadly also lived up to the organisational reputation. 164,000 tickets were sold, but an estimated 350,000 people <laughs> made it through the gates as, again, the security and poor fencing couldn't stop people making their way in. Okay, so <clears throat> you hear the 25th anniversary, something's coming up. Mm. You also know that the first time... It was pretty 50% easy to get of people in. got in without paying. Yeah. Are you showing up to this one? Just I'm probably going to just try and get, get in, in. Hey? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, nah, me too. Yeah. Look at the energy they've got. It's just insane. It's going to go for an hour. Yeah. Wait till you get to break stuff. Oh, yeah. I hope that I can get to break stuff at the same time in the story as it's on there. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Because gotta, we're going to have to stop and actually listen to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you are. Yeah. Uh, is, yeah, that, so, is that Benedict Cumberbatch in the background there? Oh, who knows? Probably okay. not. <clears throat> uh, yes, yeah, so 164,000 tickets sold, but an estimated 350,000 people made it through the gates as, again, security and poor fencing couldn't stop them. Again, the rain came down and turned the site into a mud puddle. With the fencing being so useless and the security <laughs> totally overwhelmed, festival goers were able to bring in as many drugs and as much alcohol as they wanted. 800 people would end up being taken to hospital, 5,000 would be treated in the first aid tents and three people would die. Oof. Though none from violence or drugs. Again, the event- So from what then? Uh, like- um, Heat exhaustion. Heart attacks and stuff. Oh, jeez. Like weird, weird little related things. I suppose when there's that many people in one yeah. spot, you've got- yeah, Okay. Again, the event was a financial failure and cost more <laughs> money than it made. Starting to see a trend here. Yep. And so we make it to five years later- and Michael Lang is again organising a music festival. This time, it would be Woodstock 99. And again, the idea would be to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the original event with a music festival for a new generation. Peace and love between man would be the aim, but this time with rock and roll, and more importantly, a balance sheet in the black. Michael Lang would team up with a man named John Schur, a promoter in the New Jersey area, and begin planning in 1998. They faced an uphill battle, with the reputation of Woodstock 94 preceding them. They would put a major focus on the financial outcomes of the event and would sell the rights to providing food and drink to the highest bidder, as well as the rights to the garbage disposal on the eventual site throughout the event. This would mean that the organisers were not directly responsible for these aspects, with third-party organisers taking control. 
That is foreshadowing, boy. So I can see the point of selling the rights to food and drinks because mm-hmm. you would make an instant bit of money from selling those rights and then that third party could then potentially make money on the sale of stuff. That's right. I don't see where you make the money collecting the rubbish. So neither do I. I don't know why that's something that you can buy. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't make sense to me. I don't know how they make money from that, but- Anyway. Yeah. Maybe just picking up people's drop wallets. That's how you recoup your yeah. cost. For I'm not sure. 300,000 or how many? How many oh. Maybe in that situation, it wasn't they bid for it. They just found the cheapest possible option. It, instead of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That's probably what actually happened. Yeah. So, yeah, they went for the cheapest option. Look at him go. Very distinct voice, that fella. Oh, they're nice symbols, boy. They yeah. are. I own are that you, one. Oh, do you? That's an A Custom uh, 16-inch crash. It could be anything and I'd be just like, yep. Hmm. Zildjian symbols, uh, they are over 400 years old now, the company. Coverage of the event uh, on TV would be sold to MTV. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, who would offer a pay-per-view package to watch the event from home. Radio rights were also sold, as well as the rights to sell CDs and DVDs of the event after the fact. What? I was just going to ask, because I'm, I'm periodically looking over to the, the video you got playing, which is Limp Biscuit Live. Mm. At Woodstock 99. Why is the channel Limp Biscuit Brazil? Um, you find that quite often. <laughs> Brazilian it, YouTube channel. Why is it the Brazilian Limp Biscuit channel? Well, so, just- Brazil- it just seems like South America loves rock and roll music. And if you want just like full concerts, it's always the Brazilians or like the okay. Argentines or something. Yeah. Like it's not their official. No, YouTube it's just channel. some fan group in, in Brazil. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Moving on. Go subscribe to Limp Biscuit Brazil. Yeah, give them, they've got 75,000. Yeah, listeners. they're doing all yeah, right. They do, yeah, they're not doing bad. No. Is of that, course. A, is that hey. a gold play button? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think, <laughs> this video itself has had 713,000 views. Yeah, right. And it was uploaded in, in 2020, so- That's a few hundred thousand a year. Yeah, it's still good. That's not bad. Yeah. How new metal is that guy just doing the wikis, like on the on yeah. the turntable? Like no other form of music has that now. I was listening listening to that because it's in um, Take a Look Around. Yeah. And I'm like, how do they get the tone that they want? Have they got to get to the actual right I point? I wonder on- about that too. Yeah. Are they just randomly know. doing it and going, oh, yeah, that sounds good? Or are they actually like getting to a certain point into yeah, a song they know and it. then doing it? Yeah, to get- I don't know. Or is it just once you You're get to a certain You're the music speed, guy. Oh, it, it baffles me. Okay. Because I've never played around with one, so I don't know what it sounds like. Okay. But anyway. Um, Do you remember DJ Hero? Yeah. The Guitar Hero version with the, with the turntable? That yeah. You- Not many of them out there, is no, there? No. So, back to the story. Of sure. course, <laughs> organisers would need to find a location that could hold an event this large and, more importantly, could be secured to ensure no repeat of the unexpected attendees of the last of two events I know where they by went. Michael Lang. I know the area that they chose yeah? to use. Yep. Yeah. Griffiths Air Force Base. Wow. How did you know that? Rome, point? New York. Yeah, that's the one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> The town of Rome, New York, would come <laughs> forward with Griffiths Air Force Base, <laughs> which had been closed by the Air Force in 1995 and left to decay. The mayor of Rome wanted an opportunity to make use of the site, and it would be perfect for fortification, as Lang would put it. There would be plenty of open space for campers, plenty of pre-built hangars that could be repurposed, and a perimeter fence that could be easily converted into a 12-foot high plywood wall. The wall would be dubbed the Peace Wall, and would be covered by paintings created by local artists. The layout of the venue would basically be in a triangle, with the main stage in the bottom right, a bunch of tents and vendors in them to the north of that, a rave hanger in the middle, and a secondary stage to the left. A rave hanger? Yes. That is a place I do not want to be found in. No, you do <laughs> not. Trust me. Uh, a huge amount of the area would be covered by bitumen and concrete of the runways and taxiways with very little shade to be found anywhere. So you work on a base. You yeah. know how much of that is just open. Oh, there's a lot of open area. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, like just picture an airport in your head. There's nothing out there no. to get shade from. Yeah. Um, before the event was set to begin, campers would start to arrive at the venue. And as they made their way through the security gates, they found that they weren't allowed to bring in any food or water and had to throw away what they had. Ooh. Water stations would be provided, but most people would need to buy water and all their food. 
people immediately found that the price of a bottle of water was $4, where normally around that time it would cost less than $1. Price gouging was pretty common at the vendors, which you expect at events like this, but it was pretty egregious at Woodstock. Mm. I, even still, I just feel like stopping people from bringing in their own water is a bit of a yeah dog move. Yeah. I mean, it's water. Yeah. And to expect people to just go around and fill up their bottles all the time, like, yeah. Look at the size of that stage, by the way. It's massive. I didn't cover it in this, but the size of the main stage is bonkers big. Yeah, I was just looking at it before. It, it looks like it's a an aircraft hangar that's been turned yeah. into a stage. It's not. It's a scaffolding that's structure. It's, it's huge. Yeah. And wide. That like, would be like oh, 60 metres tall. Yeah. And it's a square. So it could be, it'd be close to like 50 metres wide as well. Like just yeah. the stage area. And then you've got the, the side bits that yeah. probably go for like another- so they probably go for like each. 70 metres each, yeah. Over, it'd be over 100 yeah. metres wide. The- Do yourself a favour, look on our Facebook page and see, I'm sure I've found a photo of the stage to put up. Yeah. Just how big this thing is. Oh, you'll have this in the link tree too. Absolutely, you, so. I'll yeah. have this in there, yeah. And you should watch it. I sat down and watched it today. By the way, see that kid standing there? That's, that's like the that's, drummer's kid. No, just, did you, oh, can we, you, can you go back like 10 seconds? You need to go back another 10 seconds. We're like 19 There's minutes and 45. Daddy. It's Puff Daddy. It's P. Diddy in the background. Yeah. That's what I was just getting at. Like, kid rocks there too. He's on with a red hat. Yeah. In an ominous moment before the event began, the mayor of Rome, Michael Lang and John Schur would decide to try and christen the event by wrapping a champagne bottle in a tie-dyed t-shirt and smashing it against the scaffolding of the stage. It would take about 15 attempts to smash the bottle before it would finally break. <laughs> the video of it's hilarious. It's just oh, this guy like whiffing wow. this part. Of, he's, just, he's, like, he's holding it by the handle, like by the top he, of the bottle. It's just, hitting. He's not just bang, missing. Bang, bang, just, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> <laughs> it won't go. Yeah. That's awesome. Very, very funny. Day one, Friday. So now it was time for the festival to kick off, and almost immediately the crowd full of drunk and stoned dudes would start to <laughs> cause trouble. There was a huge amount of female nudity on site, and a fair share of dongs hanging too. Mm. And this was all it took for some dudes to take it too far. Almost the first woman on stage, actress Rosie Perez, faced chance of show us your tits when she was attempting to introduce DMX. And when Cheryl Crow got on stage for her set, she faced the same. This is why I said I'd yeah. bring back show us your tids. Tids. It tids. was tids. Show us your tids. Yeah. At one stage, Cheryl Crow would uh, reply to the crowd with a quick and snarky reply of, you'd have to pay way more than you did to see my tits. After this, <laughs> she had poo thrown at her during oh. one of her songs. She would say in 2019 that this is one of the worst gigs of her life. Can't say that's surprising. So, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the kind of crowd that we're talking about at this event. This is day one yeah. of a three-day festival. And this is very early day one. When The Offspring, Sean's favourite band, got on stage, <laughs> singer Dexter Holland would notice the number of crowd-surfing women being groped and would scold the crowd saying, just because a girl wants to go crowd surfing, it doesn't give the guys the right to molest them. You know what I'm saying? And going on to encourage the women grope to give the guys a swift kick in the balls. Nice. After this, the offspring would line up five dummies with the faces of the Backstreet Boys on them, hitting (laughs) them with baseball bats. The crowd in attendance was already hyped up, and seeing this fired them up even more. Hey, Sean, if uh, offspring isn't your favourite band, tell, tell us now. Just deny it right now. Yeah, he loves them. Cool. What I thought. There was a sentiment in the crowd that MTV was to blame for promoting boy bands over real rock and roll. And many point to this as the tipping point where anger started to be brought into the feelings of the crowd. You can certainly hear it in the crowd when they speak to the MTV presenters at points in the broadcast that you can find. So people talk about this event. It's like it's a rock heavy event, right? Yeah. And at the time, the bands that were involved were like Rage Against the Machine, Limp Biscuit. Metallica, Red Hot Chili Peppers, all these bands that yeah, are like- You did not mention a band that I did not do not enjoy. <laughs> and they're all like high energy, yeah. ragey type yeah. music, right? Very different to Woodstock original. Which is like chill out. Yeah. yeah. And also like the kind of guys that would be going to this festival in the late 90s are going to be that kind of like, you know, 
late teens, early. Yeah, you can see them in this footage, right? Oh, no, I was looking at the female nudity. Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Um, real heavy nudity in the, the documentaries on this, it has to be said. Don't, um, don't necessarily watch them with your children. As the day progressed, the heat kept increasing. Temperatures at the site ranged between high 90s Fahrenheit and 100s Fahrenheit. So, so that's, that's 35 to high 38. High 30s. Yeah, getting up towards the 40s. Which started to create delays at the water stations. What? Just that, was it a child standing on the instruments in the background? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the drummer's kid. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, so that start, the, um, the high temperature started creating delays at the water stations, exacerbating the issue of the cost of food and drink at the site. It became clear to festival goers that this wasn't a peace and love event anymore. It was about making money. As the day became night, where are we up to? I'll let you know. I'm keeping an eye on it. You've got about eight minutes. But you can see like the level of energy in the crowd. Oh, they're, and, getting, like, they're chucking stuff. Yeah, and they're getting hyped. As the set's going on, they're getting more mm. and more pumped. And he's loving it. Fred Durst is loving it. Yeah. Yeah, and he's playing off it. As the day became night, so the acts that were playing became more and more hard rock. Despite the belief that Woodstock 99 would be rooted in the peace and love of Woodstock 69, nice, the music was different now, and everybody was excited to see acts like Rage Against the Machine, Limp Biscuit, and Korn. Korn would be the second last act on, the, uh, on Friday night, but easily the most anticipated. Yeah, that's a big- Huge get. Huge get, Yeah. yeah. Those interviewed about the event would say that they had never seen a crowd as excited before a set than before Korn came on stage. And so, as Korn began their set, frontman Jonathan Davis would say that he could see the crowd moving in waves as the music washed out over them for thousands of feet. The crowd would get so worked up that security couldn't cope with the number of people being pushed over the front of the barricades, and the energy in the crowd was unbelievable. Korn had worked them into a frenzy. Entire sections of the crowd were moving together as one, and the amount of energy left people feeling like something was about to go down. People had already broken bones, split their heads open, and generally pushed each other around. What would happen next? So that comment about the crowd jumping, you Mm. can see it in the footage of Korn's performance. This crowd's big enough that you can actually watch the sound waves go through the crowd as they jump in time with the music. Oh, wow. Like, it's a big enough crowd that goes far enough that you can see the speed of sound yeah, in the that's, jumping. That's, it's cool to see. That's cool to see, but yeah. that's mind-boggling. Yeah, so the crowd is like a wave pool, mm. like going up and down in waves. Yeah. Following Corn would be Bush, a much softer brand of music. I didn't recognise Bush when I first heard the name or saw them, but I recognised one of their songs straight away. Okay. And fears were high that the energy in the crowd would have nowhere to go and would end with a riot. The frontman for Bush would even say he was nervous to step out on the stage for fear of what would happen. But thankfully, and uncharacteristically for what would happen over the next two days, the crowd would come back from the brink and calm down for a relatively uneventful end to the first night on stage. Of the 220-ish thousand people, 60,000 would find their way to the rave hangar, becoming less and less clothed and more and more drunk and high. And people said that they felt the sense of limitless potential for the rest of the event felt both incredible and terrifying, as people were doing whatever they wanted to in that hangar. Gross. Yeah, the footage of the uh, the rave is is probably the grossest of the lot. There's just people walking around nude. People said they found people having sex in the corner, like filthy, real degenerate behaviour. When did Blake? Oh, ninety eight. Yeah. When did their first Blade movie come out in 98? Because when you said Rave Hanger- Look, you can see it happening. Oh, don't worry. When you said Rave Hanger, I was thinking of the blood ray from the, the, blood uh, ray from the first Blade movie. Like, do you know mm, the scene I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they just showed a shot of everyone jumping and you mm. could see it waving out. Yeah. So, day two, that's the day we're watching here. Mm -hmm. Saturday. Here we go. The sun would rise over the Griffiths Air Force Base, or more specifically, a landfill that sat on top of Griffiths Air Force Base, as there was garbage everywhere. As you can imagine, with 200,000 on site, they had made a lot of garbage, and it seemed as though most of it wasn't being picked up. People woke up 
many of them on the grass as they hadn't made their way back to their tents, and found that bins were full and they had garbage all over their campsites. There was so much garbage that people uh, just about had to wade through it to get to the stage, and it just kept getting worse. Now that I've said that, pay attention anytime you see the ground. Okay. You don't see the ground. You just see filth. Currently, I'm seeing people yes. holding up a board and then other people standing on top of the board. Yeah. There's Kid Rock, P. Diddy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so- Who's that, that next to- That Diddy? board? Keep that in mind because that comes up in a okay. minute. To make matters worse, it seemed as though the toilets and showers weren't being cleaned at all, with some people saying the toilets smelt like they hadn't been cleaned in a year. Safe to say, it was rank. Kind of like the streets of Sydney, but not quite as bad. <laughs> I'll get dumped, Sydney. Do, 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 do. <laughs> That's a classic Aaron takedown. Some of the festival workers would make an attempt to hand out garbage bags to get the attendees to help clean up. Okay. Right, good, good job. But as you can imagine, most people told them to piss off. Having spent hundreds of dollars already, it wasn't their job to pick up rubbish. It was clear from the garbage and disgusting toilets that the organisers didn't care enough about the attendees to provide the right resources to keep the site clean and safe. And so the frustration began to increase again. It also seemed like nobody cared that this was happening. This was evident from the interviews with Michael Lang and John Scher during the event, where they claimed everyone was having a great time, nobody had anything negative to say, and touting that they were having a very successful event. Saturday was even hotter than Friday. So as the day wore on and the Budweiser beer garden got a hammering, the general level of angst, the general level of angst and energy kept rising too. MTV reporters started getting harassed for the amount of pop music on the channel, and some of the performers would encourage the crowd to throw empty bottles towards the stage to protest the crazy prices of concessions. Yeah, so like they've got this footage of MTV people walking around and the, there's people coming up and they're like I'm sick of these boy bands, boo, and like <laughs> heckling them as they're walking past. And yeah, you saw it in, earlier in this. They're just like hucking bottles at the stage. Yeah. Yeah. After throwing the bottles at the stage, they turned the bottles on the, end, on the MTV hosts and even event security. People were coming out of the crowd unconscious with heat stroke, with over a, a thousand people being treated in the end. The energy in the crowd was building along with the anger and the feeling that there was a powder keg set to blow. All it would take was a match, as, and as Limp Biscuit took to the stage, it became clear where that would come from. Yeah, Limp Biscuit's going to be a good match, especially when they get to song number, what was it, nine? Yeah, song number nine. So we're seven minutes away in the footage. Uh, I'm going to talk through the earlier parts of the set. I'm going to let John and I listen to break stuff because that's important, and then, uh, and then we'll kick it off again. Limp Biscuit were one of the most popular acts in the world at the time. Little John was pumped for them, that's for sure. That's you, not yeah, Little John, the, uh, the no, rapper. And they were the idols for a huge amount of the hyped up crowd. They represented anger and aggression. And it seemed pretty clear that the band, and lead singer Fred Durst in particular, weren't going to calm the crowd down. After an introduction by Vern Troyer, that's right, another reference to the show's favourite movie franchise, Austin Powers. <laughs> Vern Troyer, of course, being Mini-Me. Yep. The band hit the stage, and immediately the intensity of the crowd increased. Was the first Austin Powers out by then? I think so. Yeah. If not, it was about to be, as it came out in 99. After a few songs, Durst was asked by festival staff to calm the crowd down, which he relayed to the crowd by saying, they want to ask us to ask you to mellow out a little bit. They say too many people are getting hurt. Don't let anybody get hurt, but I don't think you should mellow out. Yeah, the first Austin Powers is 97, so yeah. Oh, yep, so it was out. So after a few more songs, they got to the song Break Stuff. It's at this point that I'm going to let John and I pay attention to the fantastic performance that they put on. Well, if you know the song Break Stuff, I mean, it's in the title. Yeah. It's all about just not giving a... Not giving a bleep. Yeah. And just letting go, telling people to shove it. Just one of those days feeling like a freight train. Yeah. First one to complain leaves with a blood stain. Yeah. That's right, I'm a maniac. But you watch your back because I'm up the program. I know the song. Anyway, uh, feel free to take your headphones off. We'll just listen to this. <laughs> were you aware of me to re- were you thinking I was gonna recite the lyrics? I know the song. This is gonna be fun to edit out. Just a ten minute block of nothing. I mean, you can really tell he's not a uh, fantastic singer in this no. song. <laughs> You can actually see it in this. 
in between songs, he like walks off to the side and some guy comes out and he's like, and then he walks back out and says, he's like, they want you to calm down. Yeah, I think I saw it before. Yeah. Was Behind Blue Eyes the last song they released? That was a good song. Was that them? Yeah. Behind Blue Eyes. That's, that's Limp Bizkit. Is, it, is that Limp Bizkit? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did you know that? No. <laughs> that's that's wild, actually. And it was, it was like uh, maybe 2008, 2009. It was a few years after like the height. They had a very short window. It was like probably five years, right? 2003, it was grade 12. Behind Blue Eyes, Limp Bizkit. Right. <laughs> oh, Aaron likes a Limp Bizkit song. Do you like Behind Blue Eyes? I like Limp Bizkit. Oh, do you? Yeah. White trash. <laughs> I like new metal. What's, what's Sean's thoughts on Limp Bizkit? I think Sean just doesn't like Fred Durst. Oh, okay. He really doesn't like the Chili Peppers. Yeah. I love the Chili Peppers. Oh, just mention it. See what he does. All right, so you've seen that now, boy. Yeah. I'll have cut this down so you, it seems to you like we haven't spent 10 minutes doing nothing, but uh, you've seen that now. So you heard the preamble where Durst, uh, before they get into break stuff, asks the crowd, how many of you like NSYNC? And you heard the booze. Mm-hmm. Can as, confirm. As break stuff progressed and got to the breakdown, Durst would monologue with the crowd saying- Time to reach deep down inside and take all that negative energy and let that shit out of your fucking system. You got girl problems, you got boy problems, you got parent problems, you got boss problems, you got problem you got job problems. You got a problem with me, you got a problem with yourself. It's time to take all that negative energy and put it the fuck out. You feel me Woodstock? All right, let's bring it out. When this song kicks in, I want to see you fucking kick in. And that was all it took. Footage of the crowd at this moment shows almost the entire 200,000 people jumping up and down as one, with the crowd going back hundreds of metres from the stage. People were getting hit and kicked, trampled, and a hell of a mosh pit broke out. Out in the middle of the crowd was the sound tower, a scaffolding structure that housed the sound desks, lighting, and cameras, fully surrounded by a plywood wall. Right. It was an island in the sea of people. And that worked up crowd started trying to climb up the wall and even pulling pieces off. Security from the stage tried to push their way through the crowd, but there was little they could do. By the end of break stuff, they really had broken stuff. And the sound crew were forced to mute Durst's microphone to allow the medical team time to get to get to the injured crowd members. The crowd had pulled off large pieces of the plywood wall and were crowd surfing on them. And had breached into the sound tower. Things were getting out of hand fast. As Limp Biscuit continued their set, Durst was given multiple requests to try to calm down the crowd, but his only attempt was during the song Nookie, where he told the crowd, we already let all the negative energy out. It's time to reach down and bring that positive energy to this motherfucker. It's time to let yourself go right now because there are no motherfucking rules out here. Immediately after finishing Nookie, Durst would ask the crowd to get him a piece of plywood so he could sing while crowd surfing. He definitely wasn't trying to calm this crowd down. Immediately after the crowd surfing incident, the organisers pulled the plug on the set and ended it early. Durst would get a lot of heat for the way he acted during this set. And honestly, it's quite easy to see why he gets criticism. He definitely didn't try to ease the crowd down. On the flip side, if you've ever been in front of a crowd that are loving what you're doing, it's impossible to turn it off. Yeah. Oh, you'd know that. I would know Anytime that. Anytime Aaron gets in front of more than three people who love what he's doing, he just plays it up so much. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why so many musicians end up on drugs, because the high from a performance is addictive. And if you see how the crowd was acting, you can understand why he didn't turn it off. Um, I've played music to like 80 people before who were invested in it. And they were like, it was like a kid's summer camp. So they were like, <laughs> probably the oldest person there would have been like, 17 yeah and that was like the high that was like insane like to have 70 or 80 people just like invested in the music you're playing so i can't even imagine what a real concert would be Mm. like like you imagine the feeling coming off stage after this performance like it's no wonder he didn't turn it down yeah yeah um and like we've been watching this there's not really anything different they're doing than any other concert you've ever seen right Not really it's just their brand of music though yeah it's to blame Limp Biscuit for being Limp Biscuit's pretty unfair. 
And uh, yeah, like it was a crowd ready to do this anyway. They just needed that spark and it just happened that Limp Biscuit were the spark. Oh, and they had the perfect song for it, Break Stuff. That- yeah. The perfect song for it. Yeah. So it was it was set to go off. Still, after the set, there was so much energy in the crowd and with very little opportunity to release it any other way than to keep the party going. When the performances on the main stage ended for the night, the only thing left to do was move over to the rave hangar where Fatboy Slim was about to perform. <laughs> what? Just Fatboy Slim in a rave hangar just doesn't seem... Doesn't seem like your kind of place? No, just... I can't see Fatboy Slim in a rave hanger. Like, yeah, I don't put him in that kind of music. Yeah, it's a bit weird, isn't it? But he does dance music and yeah. that's what the rave was for. Yeah. So into the early hours of the morning, the crowd would continue to party. There was sex, drugs and alcohol everywhere, with the Saturday night rave making the Friday night one look like a kid's party. Oh, jeez. Unfortunately, assaults on women were recorded throughout the night, the, most, uh, the worst of which would result in lawsuits being brought against the festival in later months. Fatboy Slim was playing his set when suddenly a pair of headlights started pushing through the crowd. Someone, high on drugs, had driven a van into the hangar. Fatboy Slim was told to stop the music and the crowd were told that the van had to be removed. People started hurling bottles at the stage and the anger grew again. Eventually the van would be pushed out of the hangar, Fatboy Slim would finish his set and would rush out of there to the safety of the airport to fly out the next morning. Worst thing about this is, it wasn't even the worst things would get. Day three, Sunday, would bring another level, another level of energy, anger, and destruction. So yeah, you're you're watching right now, Durst. Like he's trying, he's calling for the plywood. I think. Yeah, he's trying to get into the crowd. So his first thing was he wanted to get out to that little sound tower that was out there. Yeah. And then he sees the plywood. He's like, I want to go on that plywood. Yeah. So this rave got pretty intense on the Saturday night. Um, Is it, I got a guy at work. He loves his metal. Yeah. And he would often describe going to concerts or whatever. And he's just like, you just end up with two sides and you just run into each other as hard as you can. Yeah. And that's all they do the mm. entire song, just running in, like dropping shoulders into people. and Yeah. Just bouncing off each other, really. Yep. But yeah. Yeah, but the rave, this guy just like got in a van and just drove, drove it into in. the crowd. And people were like jumping on top of it and like dancing on top of it as it drove in. And the organizers are like, oh my God, get that van out of there. So yeah, they had to put like a hold on and- Everyone was, uh, everyone was getting a little bit out of hand. So let's get to day three, Sunday. Again, the sun would rise over a sea of garbage, but this time the toilet and shower blocks were even worse. People were breaking the pipes leading into the area in process of the long lines, creating free-flowing rivers of water around the showers and toilets. People oh, so start- they're, they're breaking the inlet pipes, not necessarily the outlet pipes. Yeah, so they're breaking the pipes in so they can get water easier, yep. right? But that's then creating this like big, huge puddle area yep. around the toilets. People started doing slip and slides through the mud, <laughs> getting that, absolutely covered in it. That does sound fun though. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> Little did they know the porta potties were overflowing into water oh, from the pipes. Yeah, that's not so much fun anymore. Making a mud and poop mix. Oh, <laughs> a mud and mud mix. Yeah. Oh, mud pies. Many people would get sick from this in the coming days if they weren't already sick from the poor water quality. Scientific testing of the water available at the water stations over the three days of the festival came back with failed results showing that the water was not suitable for human consumption. So they found that pretty much every single tap that was available uh, had been contaminated with feces. Yeah, okay. Yep, that's yeah. awesome. So they the there was an interview that I saw with someone that had been at Woodstock, and she said that she woke up on Sunday morning with trench mouth. Yeah. You can't hear my face, but I've- John's made a very ick face. <sighs> What's the noise this face would make? Yuck. 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 Yeah. So pretty foul. Pretty foul. <clears throat> the organizers of the festival- <laughs> <clears throat> The organisers of the festival would hold a press conference on Sunday morning where they were asked about the events of the night before, which they classified Saturday, and they classified Saturday as a satisfying and eventful day. They would attempt to downplay the events that happened during Limp Biscuit, with John Schur being grilled over everything from where he was to the amount of security at the event. He claimed that it was only about 50 people that caused the trouble. You've seen the footage. I'm watching the, the You're footage. watching it right it's, now. It's not 50 people. No. 
<laughs> it's significantly more than 50 people. The press weren't satisfied with their answers, especially with most of the chaos and destruction being televised live on MTV's pay-per-view coverage. John Schur and Michael Lang would gloss over everything that had happened. MTV coverage of the early hours of the day showed tired, grubby people walking through a tent city that looked more like a third world refugee camp. Many people started to leave, with news broadcasts showing people driving out. People interviewed said that the heat had sapped their energy and the conditions inside made it unbearable to continue. Price gouging continued, with the cost of a bottle of water ballooning to $12. Holy crap! Yeah, that's 12 times what it would normally cost as the stocks ran low. People started to graffiti the walls and infrastructure with Down With Profit stock, which I think is fantastic rebel branding. Despite the negativity, there was a rumour that a special closing act had been arranged for the end of the concert. Ooh. In interviews, Sher and Lang would state that the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Sean's second favourite band, were the last official oh. act. What? Dong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the dude that's like totally nude when he gets up on the middle of the wood. He gets up on top of the wood just completely <laughs> starkers. Yeah. And look, there's, yeah, it's, this crowd was wild. Like, can you imagine going to a concert and seeing a dude's dick? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you, you just can't. So yeah, my, uh, Sher and Lang would state the Red Hot Chili Peppers were the last official act with something special being cooked up for the finale. Rumours included Prince, Guns N' Roses returning from retirement, Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, and Michael Jackson. People were excited to see what might happen. The feeling in the crowd, though, was intense. Everyone was starting to hit their breaking point with the conditions. Performers were saying that they felt the tension from the stage, and it was visible in the way people were starting to pull the peace wall down around the venue. This was all again brushed over by the organisers in the closing press conference held late on Sunday, who claimed the event was a massive success, jeering at the people that doubted they could pull it off. They even claimed that the security had worked perfectly. Michael Lang would claim that people were just pulling down the wall to get a souvenir. Everyone was slapping themselves on the back, and the mayor even said he would consider uh, he would welcome the event back next year. Just a little bit too soon, Mayor. Too soon. The last act, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. There he is. Mini yeah, me. there's Mini Me. <laughs> He's like dancing away, and yeah. it just looks so silly. <laughs> the last act, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were ready to take the stage in all of this tension, but it was clear from the first moment that they weren't going to calm the situation down. Their bassist flee would walk out on stage completely naked yeah, for the entire set. That definitely sounds like something Flea would do. Jumping up and down, hanging dong. So, like, he literally walks out and he's like, Bleh! completely nude. Yeah. Organisers were on their last legs when a call came over the radio. We're going to start handing out 100,000 candles soon to the crowd. Yeah, not smart, hey. No. It just goes to show this, like, disconnect between the people that are on the ground and the people that are, like, organising the whole event Mm. of, like... Clearly not there. Yeah, like, guys, no. Don't give these people candles and tell them to light them. It had been intended as a candlelight vigil for the Columbine shootings that had happened just a few months earlier. Very Very few people had known this was coming, and there was a huge backlash from those who understood what was happening in the crowd. As the Chili Peppers broke into Under the Bridge... The crowd lit the candles that were being handed out, and there was a sea of lights. I never want to feel like I did that day. Take me to the place I love. Take me all the way. I don't. Is there another line after that? Yeah, anyway. That was quite nice. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a problem. Sometimes I feel like my only friend. Is the city I live in The city of (laughs) angels Lonely as I am Together we cry I forgot the lyrics there I do like that song It was uh, very nice Cut it or delete it We do a good harmony, boy Do we? Should we sing? No (laughs) I do not sing Are we the new Tenacious D? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Look into my eyes and it's easy to see One and one, one makes two, two, two and one make three It was destiny Once, Once every, every hundred thousand, thousand years or so When the sun doth shine, shine and the moon doth glow, glow And the grass doth grow whole. <laughs> We're doing like hand gestures and everything Do you remember the version that we made for Club? Yeah Or the version I made They're for Club? Shined a shiny, shiny Mando, Mando. <laughs> Squeaky squeak with his baldy head <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, now that Make we've got that concert out of the way. The greatest club. <laughs> now that we've got our little concert out of the way. <sighs> It'd be interesting to hear that back, our little harmonization. I think it's in, I it sounded great to me. Okay. I don't think it's gonna sound great no. when I hear it again. If it if it sounds okay, just maybe a little bit at the end. <laughs> I'll cut it out, put some reverb on it. Yeah, okay. Send it off to a record label. <laughs> um Well uh, <laughs> the, who is the lead singer of the Peppers? Anthony Kalidas. Oh, right. Kaidas. Okay, so if you're hearing us talk about this and Aaron's cut out our singing for a copyright strike, not because we're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um I was told once, uh, Anthony Kalidas, he couldn't sing when he first joined the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He had to go through singing lessons. And, All right. And so that's, I guess, why is it known that um, Chili Pepper songs are easy to sing? No, he, I not, didn't know that. Not the greatest singers. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. He yeah. also does like a lot of weird vocal stuff. Mm. So, yeah, probably covering up like, yeah, some, some deficiencies. Yeah. Nothing to take away from the dude. Great band, a lot of, lot of bangers. They do have a lot of bangers. I think Californication is still the record oh, for most number one hits I do, in, a, I, in a single album. Even that song, Californication, great song. Mm. Californication, Under the Bridge, Walk This Way. Yeah. One thing I love about that album is that if you listen closely to the drums, they, when they recorded it, they did it like a big, in a big room and they put microphones at the end of PVC pipes. What did I say? Walk this way. That was Aerosmith. Never mind. That wasn't. I, I was a bit confused by no, that. That's Aerosmith. They, they put microphones in the end of big PVC pipes. Yeah. Um, and there was different length pipes, and so they used different length pipes for different types of reverb. Oh, okay. So you can hear it, particularly on the snare. Like, so not like a thong on top of a downpipe to. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. no, you can hear like this really weird reverb, and that's, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, next time I'm listening to, was it Californication or? It's the whole album. Oh, yeah. I'll. Keep an Any out. song in there, you can hear it. But yep. All right. Yeah. So anyway, getting back to 99, Chili Peppers broke into Under the Bridge and the crowd lit the candles that were being handed out. <laughs> I don't ever want that. No, I want to do that again. <laughs> and there was that sea of lights. It was a very peaceful and beautiful moment. Yeah. That was until the inevitable happened and a bonfire broke out towards mm-hmm. the back of the crowd. Security would it temporarily stop the show and request the fire brigade to be sent out to put it out. MTV would report on the situation, noting the fact that it could get much worse from here. The fire brigade, though, would refuse to go out into the crowd for fear of what might happen. The lead singer of the Chili Peppers, Anthony Kaitis, or Kalidas, I think it's Kaitis, would be begged by the mayor of Rome to calm the crowd down. Kaitis said there was nothing he could do, went out on stage, and then the Chili Peppers played a cover of Fire by Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not, because oh, multiple mean, fires started breaking out after this. Not the greatest of ideas, but... It's a bit of an asshole move. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I can do. Also, here's a song about fire. <laughs> I went down in a burning ring of fire. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, multiple fires started breaking out. You yeah. can see it in the footage of the of the concert is like whenever they pan out to the crowd, there's just fires in the oh, background. I have to look this up. Keep, and, keep um, going. I'm going to look this up. As the Chili Peppers wrapped their set, it was time for the much-hyped grand finale. Would it be Prince or Michael Jackson or even Guns N' Roses? No, it would be a laser show and a video of Jimi Hendrix at the original Woodstock. It was Elvis. Nope, just a video of Jimi Hendrix. The crowd was pissed. They had been led on and now played this reminder of of what the event should have been about. They immediately started throwing everything they could into the fires, including the plywood they had ripped off the walls around the venue. Yep. That is literally the first, the first image. photo. Yep. The first frame. It's uh <laughs> it's flea T posing on the stage, completely nude, hanging dong. The MTV reporters uh, would be pelted with bottles and rocks, eventually endri- ending their coverage with an emergency evacuation from the venue. The sky went orange with the amount of fires burning. One reporter said it felt like covering news in a war zone, and it wasn't far off. As the riot grew and the flames grew higher and higher into the air, crowd members started climbing the towers that held the line array speakers for the sound system. These towers were about 15 metres tall, and one in particular started to sway as the crowd worked to pull it down. Eventually, it would fall, luckily missing people on the ground, but still with two people on top of it. The crowd would then move on to the vendor booths in the middle of the venue, 
stealing everything they could, breaking into ATMs to steal money, and generally just destroying anything they could find. The production officers got boarded up with wood to stop people breaking in. This was a real riot with some really pissed off people. Yeah, because they were promised- Well, were they actually promised- They weren't promised. No, but it was like, like a rumour. It was this rumour that just got fueled by the promoters. Yep. And then it was just like, oh, hey, here's some lasers and a video of Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> and after everything else that had gone on, you know, the garbage everywhere, yeah. the poo water- the Fires. price of buying everything, the heat, the oh, lack water's of shade. probably twenty-five dollars a bottle at this point. Yeah, especially as they start putting out fires. Um, <laughs> they're probably <laughs> you say that, but the the water the fire brigade's using is probably more drinkable than what was being yeah. provided as yeah. drinking water. Probably a lot less shit in it. Yeah, yeah. So like all these people have just had the worst weekend. They've been promised peace and love. They've been promised this like fantastic event, and then just been treated like animals. For multiple days. And so they're just like, you know what? Let's burn this place to the ground. Um, you yeah. say that, but every video I've looked at so far when it goes out to the crowd, it looks like the crowd's having a good time. Yeah, because you've got to remember that's when the music's on. Yeah. Okay. Right? As soon as that music goes away, you're just full of energy. Again, I haven't been to a festival, so I don't know what that's like. Yeah, I've never been to one that goes this bad. No, but you but, have an idea of- Yeah. Like, you just get so hyped up, right? Like, you- you, like you just, you, and you're in this massive crowd of people that feel the same way, and you just get this like mob mentality of, in my experience, like happiness, mm. like everybody's really happy. But you can imagine that turning very quickly and being like, I've been hot for three days. I've been charged twelve dollars for a bottle of water. Yeah. I've had to wash myself in piss water, and like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. And then off it goes. Like you see someone pulling down a, a frigging towel with speakers on it and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go do that too. Yeah. Um, like it'd be quite easy to get wrapped up in, yeah. you know? So the next thing that happened was an explosion rang out over the festival. Okay. A row of trucks had been set on fire. There was about 12 or 15 like semi-trailer trucks. Yeah. And each of them had a tank of propane. They all started exploding and it's absolutely amazing that nobody was killed by these. At this point, the state troopers were sent in to get everything under control, which thankfully they eventually would. Organisers would take it all in, in absolute disbelief of what had taken place. The next morning, the site was littered with burned out trucks, destroyed infrastructure and an unbelievable amount of garbage. There would be an unplanned press conference on Monday morning after the destruction. Michael Lang would again try to downplay the situation, claiming it was a small number of people and that overall the crowd had been great. Michael and the rest of the organising team would take no responsibility for what took place. In future interviews, Lang would claim that people were having such a good time that they had too much energy and didn't want the event to end. John Schur would say that the kids were entitled and fearful of growing up and getting real jobs. Again, to this day, no responsibility for the greed and disrespect shown to the people that attended. The legacy of Woodstock 99 would mean that would be that of destruction. It wouldn't be remembered for the amazing lineup and fantastic performances. Well, yeah, you say that, but and all the bands you've mentioned so far have been like top quality. Like it was, bands. I, I want to be at this festival. Yeah, with regardless the bands of the fact yeah. that it's disgusting. What a lineup! Like I haven't even mentioned that Rage Against the Machine was there. Yeah, uh, you did. You did say earlier. Yeah. But like they have this I've, fantastic. Set. Have you got a list of the lineup to go through at the end? Like once you finish. I can go find that and go through well, it. Well, finish, finish, and then we'll go yeah. through it at the end. So the legacy wasn't the fantastic lineup and great performances. It would be remembered for the price gouging and anger. Michael Lang would attempt to organise further Woodstock events in future, even as recently as 2019 for the 50th anniversary, but understandably, he wouldn't be able to source the funding to get it off the ground. Good riddance. So there hasn't been one since. There has not been a Woodstock since. When so was- there's been events that are like- Yeah, when was Fire Festival? <laughs> that was like two years ago, wasn't it? I think it was more than that. Um, yeah, but that that is the festival. 2017 was Fire Festival. And there's a proposed one for December 6th next year. Next year? Mm-hmm. Oh, geez. So, yeah, day one on the East stage, you had James Brown, Jamiroquai, Cheryl Crow, DMX, The Offspring, Corn, and Bush. Yep. There's a few others there, but uh, on the West stage- the Umbilical Brothers, apparently. Hang on. Yeah. As in the Australian yeah. comedy duo, the Umbilical yeah. Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are awesome, but not who I would expect to no. see. 
<laughs> no. Uh, insane, Cl- insane Clown Posse was there. Uh, Moby played at the Emerging Artist stage. So this is before Moby was big. Ben Lee was Hang there. On. Who has the song that's dishing Moby out? Eminem. It is Eminem. Okay, yeah. Uh, on the Saturday at the East stage, you had Kid Rock. Uh, you had Counting Crows, Dave Matthews Band, Alanis Morissette, Limp Biscuit, Rage Against the Machine, Metallica. That's a good lineup. The West stage had Ice Cube, uh, the Chemical Brothers. Where was the Offspring? Did I just totally miss them? No, you said that. On oh yeah, first day. they played before Corn. Yeah. Um, then you had yeah, nobody really of note except Fatboy Slim in the Rave Tent. On the Sunday, you had Willie Nelson, uh, Elvis Costello, Jewel, Creed. Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Megadeth, and that's it. For, oh, Muse were there. Huh. There you go. Muse were at the Emerging Artist stand, uh, stage. Oh, that's weird to think of Emerging Artists. Yeah, I know, right? But um, yeah, like a hell that's, of a lineup. That's a lineup. Yeah. That's a lineup that I'd want to go to, and I don't yeah. go to festivals. Yeah. I Just for the Umbilical Brothers. like <laughs> <laughs> John's favorite band. Um, they don't even sing. No. They're just like noises and stuff, aren't they? They do performance, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the end of the Woodstock 99 story. Um, I would highly recommend that you go and watch um, Trainwreck, the Woodstock 99 documentary on Netflix. Yep. Um, I'm just going to play the, op- the intro for you, which shows like- The aftermath? Yeah. So, yeah, this is like the day after. So, you can see like destroyed the infrastructure there. Yeah. yeah. All the rubbish. Is that the peace wall? Uh, yeah, that's part of the peace wall. There's the porta potties and stuff. There's some of the fires still burning out. So this is at one of the stages. So you can see the speakers there. Overturned, burned out car. See what I mean? It looks like a war zone. Yeah. There's like one of the tents that got absolutely ravaged the night before. What do you put on your insurance claim? Yeah, I was at a festival when my car got turned over and set on fire. (laughs) I don't know, hey. Like, it just, yeah, crazy. Anyway, that's Woodstock 99. Thanks for enlightening me. I had really no idea. What yeah. It was that crazy. Yeah. It, it's, it's probably the most insane festival I've ever heard of. Um, well, yeah, thanks. Boy, that was no words, really. Yeah. Like, just watch, watch the documentary because a, a lot of what I'm talking about, you need to see. Yeah. Like they show the mud puddles. They show the like people lying on the grass just trying to get some shade under a piece of wood. Like, that's yeah. I I doubt there would have been much grass left after no th- three days. Yeah, yeah. And that's that. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, this has been Cheeky Tales episode fifty nine nine. The big six zero next time. Woodstock ninety nine. So uh, yeah, um, go to our socials on Facebook, Instagram, and. Twitter slash X or threads. If Aaron wants to post on there, um, <laughs> get on there, find the link tree. We'll have the Limp Biscuit video up there. Go have a look. Skip to, I think it was 38 minutes to see the limp, uh, what, when it. There's a little guide down the bottom for the times. Yeah. When it kicks off to, uh, yep. That, that's on the Limp yeah. Biscuit Brazil channel. Um, go to the link tree. Aaron will have pictures um, posted of. It will I help guess, you understand what we're talking about and how bad it looked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, while you're on the social media page, having a look at Linktree, give it a share. Get us out there. Uh, spread the word. Um, yeah. Share but- us with a friend who likes music. That's everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Um, yeah. So thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking with us for 59 episodes. Um, Two years. It's been- Wild been to think. It's been good, especially when I keep hearing things like a lot of people say like- um, podcasts don't get past most podcasts don't get past the third episode Mm. or something like that or it's like only 10 percent of podcasts get past episode three we're the one percent baby yeah we're in there so (laughs) yeah give us a share we'd love to get this podcast into more ear holes yep fill Uh, those ear holes with our voices especially when you hear us singing (laughs) amazing (laughs) all right and that's it for uh, from me uh you got any last words boy you want to I do not have any last words. Sean, um, do you have any last words? As usual, Sean going silent in the, uh, the closing stages. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, let's wrap it up. Good night, chiquitos. 
Got him. Good night. <laughs> Stole his line. <laughs> <laughs>